Ladies and gentlemen, A.G. Salzberger. So given the, given the reach and resonance of the Me Too movement, it'd be easy to assume that the awakening of our national conscience was inevitable. To assume that of course men like Harvey Weinstein and Bill O'Reilly would eventually be held accountable. But exposing wrongdoing, especially by those in positions of enormous privilege and power, has always been difficult work, full of equal parts drudgery and daring. And these stories were no exception. With courage and perseverance, today's honorees managed to not only reveal abuses of power by two of the most prominent men in America, they helped spark a global reckoning that continues to reshape our society for the better. Emily, Jody, and Megan exemplify what I consider to be the highest calling of journalism, and that's holding power to account. They pursued their fundamental mission through long nights, through dead ends, and extreme pressure from subjects of their stories. But even a team of ex Mossad agents wasn't enough to deter them from finding the truth and sharing it with the world. For her initial O'Reilly story, Emily and her colleague, Mike Schmidt, dug through hundreds of pages of court filings, tracing settlement agreements to piece together a disturbing pattern. That story took eight months and 60 interviews. Jody and Megan's initial story on Weinstein took more than five months and 100 interviews. The most important work was earning the trust of women who had suffered harassment and abuse from these men, many of whom were understandably hesitant having been ignored or discredited in the past. Their willingness to share their stories on the record was vital for, for building the broader Me Too movement. By giving the women a platform to be heard and to be believed, Jody, Megan, and Emily, along with their brilliant editor, Rebecca Corbett, emboldened women from all walks of life to come forward and to share their stories. And that sparked more than just a conversation. It sparked actual, meaningful, long overdue change. And the project they began is still far from finished. Uh, there are still far too many stories yet to be written. But with reporters like Emily, Jody, and Megan leading the way, I know those stories will be told. The truth will win out, and tomorrow will be better than yesterday. And that is the power of journalism. So I'd like to welcome to the stage to accept the inaugural uh, Matrix Insight Award, uh, Jody Cantor, Emily Steele, and Megan Tui. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, AG, for that kind introduction. And thank you for New York Women in Communications for including us in this distinguished company today. We're so honored. This time last year, I was, in fact, on maternity leave, struggling with sleepless nights and dirty diapers, when a headline jolted me out of my newborn days. Fox News had just fired Bill O'Reilly following an investigation by my colleagues at the New York Times. <clears throat> Through many months of meticulous reporting, Emily Steele and Mike Schmidt had uncovered millions of dollars in payoffs that O'Reilly made to silence women who accused him of sexual misconduct. The financial trail of misconduct was stunning and the public was outraged. So were Fox advertisers. <clears throat> O'Reilly, perhaps the most powerful figure in conservative media, was forced to leave his job. I didn't know Emily or Mike at the time, but I cheered on their work from my couch in Brooklyn, thrilled to see its powerful impact. I was equally thrilled when another colleague, Jody Cantor, called to inform me that an even deeper investigation was underway. Journalists across the newsroom were fanning out to Ford plants, to Silicon Valley, and other industries to see if other powerful men had sexually harassed women and then covered up their violations. 
Jody was looking at Harvey Weinstein, the film producer, who was long rumored to be a sexual predator. My maternity leave was coming to an, an end, and our editor asked, did I want to join her in the reporting? As a new mother of a baby girl, I couldn't imagine a more important investigative project to tackle. If done right, it had the potential to make the workplace safer for my daughter's generation. But I also knew that it would be extremely difficult. For years, other news organizations had tried and failed to report on Weinstein. He had repeatedly used threats and intimidation to suppress the truth. We would only be able to follow through on a reporting on him and other powerful men if the New York Times supported us. It did. Dean Bacay and Matt Purdy, working under unimaginable pressure in an astounding news year, made it clear exactly how we were to deal with O'Reilly, Weinstein, and other subjects of our investigation, firmly, fairly, and most importantly, on the record. Rebecca Corbett, who's also here today, um, <coughs> our investigations editor, was so deeply at one with the project that she stayed in the newsroom until 3 a.m. to worry about every single choice of word. The legal threats came, as expected, but at every turn, the Times attorney, David McCraw, was there too, fiercely defending us. The investigation spanned the generational shift in leadership at the New York Times, and we are so grateful that both AG and his father had our backs every step of the way. In the end, <laughs> in the end, the entire institution rose up behind us to confront the bullies and protect the vulnerable. Getting women to come forward with these stories was not easy, which is why we want to salute the women who took the leap. My colleague Mike Schmidt and I started reporting on Bill O'Reilly's record of sexual harassment settlements in August of 2016. That's more than a year before the Me Too movement set off a global reckoning. At the time, women feared that talking publicly about the sexual harassment would jeopardize their careers. As many of you know, they feared that they wouldn't be believed. Mike and I made phone calls, we knocked on doors, and we started to find a number of women who'd been silenced after reaching settlements over allegations against Mr. O'Reilly. Other women we knew also had stories about him, but they didn't want to speak about the king of cable news. And then I called Wendy Walsh, a journalist turned psychology expert who'd been a frequent guest on Mr. O'Reilly's show. At first, she thought I wanted the, her opinion on the psychology of sexual harassment issues. But then, when I asked about whether she had had an experience with Mr. O'Reilly, she told me about a Los Angeles dinner where he promised her a job, then never fo followed through on the offer after she refused to join him in his hotel suite after the meal. That story was off the record, she said. She didn't need the trouble that would come with talking about an issue like sexual harassment publicly. And so I called, and I called, and I called, and I called. And then I flew across the country to take a Pilates class with Wendy in Los Angeles. <laughs> After the class, we got coffee, and I explained what Mike and I had found so far in our reporting, how there were so many other women who were locked in ironclad confidentiality agreements. I told her that she still had her voice, and that's when she told me that she would come forward with her story. I recently looked at my notes from that conversation, and she said, at that time, she said that the tide had shifted on these issues, that she wanted men to learn how they needed to treat women in the office, and she wanted women who may have been subject to terrible acts of sexual harassment to be brave and speak up. She said that she was speaking out for her daughters. I cried, and then I ran back to the hotel room and I called Mike. When our investigation into O'Reilly published months later, she was the only woman who went on the record to talk about her allegations. She was a silence breaker. Every woman who told her story make it, made it easier for the next. 
The entrepreneurs Lindsay Meyer and Catherine Minshew spoke to my colleague Katie Brenner about fighting for changes in the boardrooms and offices in Silicon Valley venture firms. Then came the extraordinary reporting by Jody and Megan about Harvey Weinstein, in which Ashley Judd, the movie star from Tennessee, and Laura Madden, a former Miramax employee, were the first to speak out against his behavior. There was Tanya Exum, a Ford factory worker in Chicago, Dana Min Goodman, Julia Wallow, Rebecca Corey, three of the comedians with stories about Louis C.K., Natalie Sable, Jamie Seat, and Trish Nelson, all employees of the Spotted Pig restaurant, who also said, me too. At Vice Media, there was Abby Ellis, Helen Donahue, Gabrielle Schaefer, and Amanda Rue, all women in their 20s and 30s, who told me enough was enough. As Gab said, there are so many stories that will go unwritten and names left unnamed that I hope I can play a small part to represent. I hope women have the courage to speak up and then men volunteer their behavior and facilitate healing and change. The chorus of women's voices grew louder and louder and louder and the world finally listened. Just in the past couple of days, I've been in touch with a number of these sources who trusted us with their stories. They've all said how astounded they were that these pieces of information that they shared allowed us to follow the facts and report a story that became bigger than any of us. We continue to be astounded and amazed by their bravery. As those women began to talk to us in 2016 and early 2017, and our team sat in conference rooms at the Times, trading confidential pre-publication impressions, we felt a sense of dawning recognition. We were not just chronicling the experiences of scattered victims. We were not just reporting on individual perpetrators. By looking at the Weinstein cases in Hollywood and the O'Reilly cases in television and the venture capitalists in Silicon Valley and the Ford factory workers in Chicago, we were discovering what now seems like an entire system of silencing women and erasing their experiences. Settlements that prevent victims from warning others, non-disclosure agreements that intimidate witnesses, a massive failure by human resources departments, weak laws that leave women unprotected. The system stretches across industries. It affects the highest earning women in the country and some of the poorest. It's on the right and the left, in big offices and small, and it has been failing women for decades. Megan, Emily, and I have received many, many calls from women in recent months, and some of the most heartbreaking are from women who are 70 or 80 years old, calling to share some secret that they've never told anybody else. Their sense of loss is so palpable because Me Too came far too late for them and they can never get those years, those opportunities back. Many of us in this room pride ourselves on understanding what's going on with women in the workplace, but it turns out that even we didn't know the half of it. We now understand that harassment and abuse is not a private shame, it's a collective problem, a gigantic hurdle in the quest for equality. Right now, many of our readers and viewers are asking us what is going to happen to the alleged perpetrators, Bill Cosby, Harvey Weinstein. That's certainly a key news question. But the other question is, what happens to this whole system? We'd like to ask you in this room, we'd like to ask everybody in the country, are we still okay as a society with secret settlements? Is every offense a firing offense? And most importantly, what will all of us say to our grandchildren about this moment? Will we say that we lived through a surreal couple of months and then the issue faded away? Or do all of us get to say, we were there at the moment the walls came down and a new spirit of common decency pervaded in the workplace? The answer to those questions are not up to us. They belong to the rest of you and the rest of the world. The only thing that the three of us and all of us in this room can continue to do is to keep reporting, and that's exactly what we intend to do. Thank you so much. Thank you.